eight students have died this semester, including two this weekend. We spoke to students and faculty about mental health on campus and emails sent from the administration. And a former California senator joined protesters against a potential LA Clippers stadium. Annabird TV News is next. Live from USC, you're watching Annenberg TV News. I think what is remarkable about what is happening here is the number of student deaths that we've had in a compressed period of time. Uh, that is uncommon, and that is not something that I think very many people have a great deal of experience with. President Carol Fultz sent a letter to the USC community addressing recent student deaths and speculation around them. Good evening, I'm Caleb Michael. And I'm Elizabeth Barano. Fultz also urged anyone struggling with mental health to ask for help. Annaberg Media's Patricia kelly is here with how to, is here with us to tell us how university officials are trying to reform their responses to tragedy. Over the weekend, two students died of still unreleased causes. In an unusual email arriving late Saturday night, President Carol Fultz sought to clear up what she called speculation about the deaths. University officials are scrambling to provide more support and fine-tune its response. USC's chief health officer, as well as the vice president of student affairs, say they're trying to strike a balance between transparency and privacy. We don't want the notifications themselves to do harm. Um, we really want to get it to the people um, who might be impacted, who know, might know that individual, um, be broad enough, um, but not um, send them to everybody in the community. We have to look at the well-being and the health of students in a holistic way. And to the extent that students are struggling, to the extent that mental health issues come into play, uh, the, the healthier we can make the university, the better off everyone is going to be. President, President Fultz sent a letter this weekend to the USC community. She asked for people not to speculate about the cause of deaths and said, quote, people are searching for answers and information as we attempt to make sense of these terrible losses. Students had mixed reactions. I was just kind of confused when I heard about it because I wasn't really sure what happened. It's counterintuitive saying we're not going to tell you what happened but also don't guess what happened you know like of course if we don't know we're going to try to guess um, we're, we're going to hear rumors we're going to spread rumors like I know like for my family too it almost made them more worried because like it was so vague that they had like didn't know what to take of it and I think it would have been helpful if it was just a little bit more informative in the School of Cinematic Arts, students today mourn the loss of a senior in a school-wide gathering closed to media. Afterward, the head of the screenwriting division shared what students at the Open Forum voiced about what the university can do to better support its students. There doesn't seem to be enough response uh, at the level of, uh, of individual care. Um, I think that's an ongoing um, enhancement that the university itself is, is looking into, and I, I hope it's all going to improve. USC has resources in place to help students in times of crisis. These include walk-in and group counseling at Engelman Health Center, a 24-7 crisis hotline, and a program called Trojans Care for Trojans, where students and faculty can alert the school about anyone in need of help. A new email sent this afternoon to USC faculty took another step forward, trying to help our student body by encouraging faculty to be emotionally and academically supportive during this difficult time. Today at the Coliseum, the city of Los Angeles held its first Veterans Day celebration. Presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii made an appearance at the event and is the first female combat veteran to run for office. Cecil Hannibal has the story. The bombs bursting in air. Hundreds of veterans and supporters came to the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum to celebrate veterans and their service. And welcome to the inaugural Veterans Day L.A. The event honored service men and women from each branch of the military. And now the United States Air Force. At 11 a.m., the Coliseum's torch was lit along with a moment of silence. Presidential candidate and National Guard Major Tulsi Gabbard spoke at the event and shared her appreciation for veterans across the country. Our servicemen and women across generations 
embody truly what it means to take action. Alexander Carrera knows what that means. He served this country back in 1964. Veterans Day means uh, recognition. And, uh, he fought back tears and said he thinks about how far this country has come. So uh, I applaud what the country is doing for the veterans now. All these people are here to honor the services made by this country's military. The Parker family is here to honor Walter Parker, who died in the line of duty in 2007 in Iraq. What it means here for us, we're honoring, we're honoring Walter and the courageous step that he took to make a choice to enter into the Army. That's what today is all about, supporting our soldiers and continuing that support when they come back home. Uh, our grateful nation needs to do all that we can to make sure that every need that our veteran has when they come home after serving is met. There were many veterans of the celebration, but USC has servicemen and women right here on campus to honor today. Let's continue our celebration a little closer to home. The USC community is celebrating and supporting its veterans in a variety of ways. Ann Rare Media's Brandon Rowe talked with two campus vets at the Campus Resource Center. Chris Salora spent six years in the Army. Now he's a full-time student studying international relations and serving as an officer in the California National Guard. I go in once a week. My base is out in uh, Orange County, Los Alamitos, so the days that I get out of class early, which is normally Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I drive down and go fly. When he's not flying helicopters, Salora spends his time on campus in the Veterans Resource Center, aka the VRC, studying for his classes and planning events for the USC Veterans Association. It's a good place to come just like study. It's quiet. Um, you know, some places are just, you know, get a little loud and it's cool to having some people that are, you know, familiar with, you know, the lifestyle, uh, especially being a veteran. The VRC also helps USC veterans like Sage Clark adjust to student life. Thankfully, through the GI Bill and nine, uh, Yellow Ribbon Program, school is essentially pay, all paid for, um, but getting that money is not an easy process. Clark transferred to USC this fall and credits the VRC with helping him plan his future. I actually ended up lending a uh, interview with Northrop Grumman and getting an internship for this next summer. Um, so setting up things like that, setting apart, getting the, using the veteran brand to help push us forward. Um, is something that they do here and it's, it's awesome. The VRC also offers vets professional support for navigating things like the GI Bill and the VA. More than a thousand student vets are enrolled at USC. For Annenberg Media, I'm Brandon Rao. A residents and community activists gathered at a church in Inglewood today to protest the development of the Los Angeles Clippers Arena. Residents are against the building of the arena because of increased traffic and displacement. Demonstrators also say the development poses environmental harm. Senator Barbara Boxer says it will damage the living conditions of residents. Well, environment is the big one, but also just the ability to live in your community, an ordinary lifestyle. We are standing here now, we hear a lot of noise. That's going to be, you know, millions more car trips. So it really is a quality of life environmental issue, most of all, a degradation of the, the neighborhood. The arena site is planned to stretch from West Century Boulevard on the top end all the way down to 103rd Street on the bottom. The residents of Inglewood are less than thrilled about the large coverage area of the arena. Um, I watched a lot of my friends um, get displaced because of the um, first um, stadium that was proposed and that was created. And from there, it was like a trickle effect. Uh, our concern is about the traffic. You know, because we already have a lot of traffic here on, on this uh, area and this street. Uh, with the uh, building of that new stadium, it's not going to get any better. But we've been displaced and done wrong for a long time. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of it, you know. Annenberg Media reached out to the Clipper organization, but did not see a response. The sudden resignation of Representative Katie Hill after an alleged affair with a staffer has opened up a spot in a key Southern California district. Annenberg Media's Kevin McNamara is here once again with more on the special election. Kevin. Yeah, guys, the GOP is hoping voters in L.A. County like a rerun. Former Congressman Steve Knight has announced his return to the race, having represented the district for two turns before being defeated by Katie Hill last year. 
Night is one in a crowded field of candidates that's also expected to include Navy pilot Mike Garcia and City Councilwoman Angela Underwood Jacobs. George Papadopoulos, a former Trump campaign aide who pled guilty to lying to federal agents and spent two weeks in jail, has also filed a run. Governor Gavin Newsom has until Friday to officially call for the election. It must take place at least four months from now, and if no candidate gets at least 50 percent of the vote, a runoff election featuring the top two candidates will be held. Whoever wins won't have much time to celebrate, however. They'll have to turn around and run for the seat again in November 2020. Now back to you at the desk. The Catholic Church is about to make history. L.A. Archbishop Jose Gomez is on the path to become the first Latino president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Archbishop Gomez is now the conference's vice president. Father Richard at the USC Caruso Catholic Center shares why he thinks Archbishop Gomez will succeed as president. To have um, a leader like Archbishop Gomez at the helm of the U.S. Church, um, I think it's, it's only fitting and right because of the fact that the majority of the U.S. church are Latinos. He is an honest man, um, and he is 100% Catholic. This is a historic moment for the Latino community. Father Richard believes that Arch, Archbishop Gomez will use his presidency as a platform to advocate for U.S. immigrants and immigration policy. The East Coast is expecting an Arctic blast this week. Our weather anchor, Nicola Wenz, will have more. Workers are treated to a free lunch today, but many say USC's working conditions are not what they'd like. And a popular social media platform will start hiding likes this week. We hear from students about the change after the break. Encuentra el bosque más cercano en descubreelbosque.org. El bosque, más cerca de lo que crees. They call me Prince like I'm royalty or something. But the places I've lived ain't no palaces. So I don't need grilled salmon or a new scratching post. Just give me a cardboard box and a can of tuna and we're good. You can even change my name. I'm cool being the kitty formerly known as Prince. to the things that can keep us safe. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere will bring us wireless emergency alerts. With the unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know wherever you are. Hey, Kevin, you thinking about retirement? I'd love to, but I'm pretty busy with all this. Yeah, hey, let's meet our retirement coach, Avo. A is for taking action. Not anxiety? No, Kevin, you're gonna be fine. You sick? Barely. V is for variety. And you dance. Sort of. <laughs> Come on. O is for optimize your savings. Let Avo lead the way. Visit aceyourretirement.org today. today. Nice. Thanks. Instagram likes coveted by influencers and celebrities across the platform may soon be a thing of the past. The company says it will hide likes starting as soon as next week. Some celebrities say they are planning to boycott the app because of the changes. Annenberg reporters caught up with influencer Sydney Jaffe on campus to hear her take on the new feature. People look at followers before they look at likes, honestly. Um, I feel like it would affect me more like uh, in terms of validation. Like if I post a video of me singing, like I'm gonna wanna know that like people enjoy it and stuff like that, um, but I I think it's also kind of going to help with like the whole like mental health aspect of like social media. In a statement to Annenberg Media, Facebook said, quote, we are testing this because we want Instagram to be a place where people feel comfortable expressing themselves. Hoping to make Instagram a less competitive platform, Instagram CEO said the move targets young people. <laughs> Whether or not this feature becomes permanent will depend on its popularity amongst users next week. All right, so you're a big Instagram guy. What big do you Instagram think about that? Guy. I, I understand why they're doing it. Um, it's coming at an interesting time, but Caleb Michael TV, if you want to follow me, <laughs> just throwing that out there. All right, well, let's talk to someone special over there. Someone special. Nicola, how are you doing? 
I'm doing great, Caleb. Thank you for asking. Now, talking about some temperatures coming up here on the West Coast, we're going to see a minor, minor drop in temperatures, which for November, again, is very surprising. Currently outside, it's 68 degrees, but if we take a look at the Inland Empire, temperatures, I mean, of course, Palm Springs are usually in the, in the high 90s. Big Bear is 65 degrees. Over in San Bernardino, 88 degrees. Riverside, also 87 degrees. If we take a trip over to the coast here in Malibu, we're going to see temperatures 72 degrees tomorrow. Thousand Oaks, 82 degrees. Northridge and, uh, yes, Northridge and San Fernando in the high 80s. If we take it back to home base, we're going to see that temperatures around the USC area tomorrow are going to be at 81 degrees. LA, 74 degrees. Long Beach, 77 degrees. Over in Pasadena, Anaheim, and Pomona, in the low to high 80s. Let's take a look at the five day forecast. We're going to see more clearly what's going to be coming up this weekend. Tomorrow, 81 degrees. Wednesday, a drop into the 70s, 76 degrees. Thursday, really a big drop down to 72 degrees. And then, of course, Friday and Saturday, temperatures are going to rise. Great start for the weekend, great day for the beach. However, while this week is going to be great beach weather for all Angelinos, other parts of the country are not quite as fall friendly. On Tuesday, temperatures in the east will be 15 to 25 degrees below normal. In New York, that's as low as 22 degrees. Even Florida has temperatures that are expected to drop by at least 5 degrees, dropping down to the 60s. But now take a look at what's happening in Chicago. Snow. Lots of it. The city experienced a major snowfall in the last few hours. 3.4 inches of snow fell at O'Hare International Airport, breaking the record that was set in 1995 with 1 1.9 inches. As a result, airlines canceled more than 1,000 flights, and at this time, flights still remain canceled. The National Weather Service says 148 records nationwide are expected to be broken, tied, or come within one degree. Now, of course, not here in California because it's going to be hot, but it's crazy what's going on all, all around the whole East Coast. I know. I'm a little bit jealous. I want some of that chilly weather. Yeah, I, I think I'd, uh, I'd like to have a little bit too, but time will tell, right? Two student organizations came together to thank the people who work behind the scenes here at USC. And Media Suchi Job takes us today to Worker Appreciation Lunch. Many people who work on campus were treated a free lunch today. The Student Coalition Against the Labor Exploitation, or SCALE, and the Latinx Student Assembly organized this first worker appreciation lunch. I love to work at USC. I've been a Trojan since I was born. My family is all alumni, so I love being a Trojan and being here every single day. But not everyone is so positive. All my co-workers, they are feeling, they are had the fear feeling, fear feeling, because uh, we don't feel we are part of USC. Because, I don't know we are Latin or, or because we are a janitor. We don't know what is the reason. Scale members said it was important to recognize these employees who do manual work on campus. Like, so I as a student can support them, push USC to really listen to the workers. There are more than 21,000 employees at USC. The school is one of the largest private employers in Los Angeles. We contacted to USC media relations to respond to workers' complaints, but we're told there will be no comments for this story. It's, it's a lot of big load, especially in the, the busy times, and I'm by myself, so... Um, I like working with the people, but I wouldn't necessarily say I like working for USC. But today, many workers said they appreciated the chance to talk with the students and to feel their support. For Annenberg Media, I'm Shu Chi Zhou. Tyler, you were in Arizona this week. It was hot. I, it was, and you know what? USC brought the heat this weekend and got another road win, but not before letting a nice lead slip through their fingers. Women's soccer received their seating and placement in the playoff draw while water polo got an impressive road win against top ranked UCLA. And the end is near. Lauren and I break down the Pac-12 picture and what bowl game the Trojans could head to. Hi, I'm Smokey Cole Bear, filling in because for 75 years, Smokey only said, Only you can prevent wildfires. Meanwhile, the song was wrong. We did start the fire. Go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. One in three adults has pre-diabetes. That means it could be you, your favorite brother, your other brother. 
You, your football buddy, your football buddy. You, your plumber. Breathe right into your foot. Your plumber's masseuse. Yes. You, your dog walker, your cat jogger. With early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. Hey, let's check out this park. Oh, wow, that's really cool. To find a great local park or forest near you, go to discovertheforest.org. Roll over. Chance high five. All right. When you adopt a shelter pet, you discover all the things that make them unique. And your mother and her. I am totally a hot person. Right, guys? Thanks for being honest. They're a little bit of a lot of things, but they're all pure love. Adopt pure love at theshelterpetproject.org. Well, the boy wonder had an electric homecoming and helped lead the way to a Trojan win this weekend. This was the best Slovis has looked so far without a doubt, completing passes to each of his receivers on the first drive alone. And he didn't miss a completion until late in the first quarter. Keaton Slovis is a product of Desert Mountain High, but he wasn't the only Arizona native that had a great game. Safety as Isaiah Polamau had a couple big stops, but it was that clutch interception at the goal line, which would be his third this season. Keenan and how did it feel winning back home? Uh, it was great um, to have family and friends in the crowd and, um, you know, be in an environment that, you know, I've been playing in kind of uh, my whole life, I guess. It was fun to come back. The Trojan production came in the first quarter, but look at these numbers. The offense racked up 315 yards in the first quarter alone. Slovis passed for a career high, and he managed to get that time. That was time off the field, too. Another big game out of Kristen as he picked up 62 in rushing, but it was out of those 82 receiving yards that he cashed in on his two touchdowns. St. Brown also getting a career high in receiving yards, and now that the Trojans are utilizing him in the run game more, he racked up 207 all-purpose yards. I'm not sure if it's weird occurrence or maybe just genius that Graham Harrell can get a solid run production out of a receiver and receiving production out of a back. And defensively, the Trojans have senior Christian Rector to thank for that save the game with that interception. USC had a thrilling first quarter, but somehow only got three on the board for the rest of the game. But the Trojans, well, they got the job done. Lauren has more good news in USC athletics. Lauren. The playoff schedule for USC women's soccer was released today. The Trojans are the number two seed in their bracket with the number one seed being North Carolina. Round one of the tournament, USC will play Cal State Fullerton at home. The women of Troy hosted a watch party for the selection show earlier this afternoon to see where they would be placed in the draw. Head coach Kadani McAlpine commented on the newly released schedule. Um, I'm, I'm happy for our team. Uh, I thought the body of our work you know, was good enough to be a two seed. I think it gives us um, a great opportunity. Um, but we've got a tough Cal State Fullerton team in front of us, so um, we've, we've got to lock in and, and get ready for that. Now last year, they lost in the third round of playoffs against Florida State. The Trojans go into the tournament led by Tara McKeown and Penelope Hawking with 14 and 12 goals on the year. USC had four conference losses in the 2019 season compared to only two last year, but are seated much higher this year. USC men's water polo took down number one ranked UCLA this weekend. The Trojans played strong for the entirety of the game, leading by four at one point. Senior Marin Dasik has continued to be a standout player as he delivered his third consecutive hat trick to help the Trojans pull ahead in this difficult game on the road. Dasik had three goals in the UCLA game. He is the second highest scoring player on the team with this season with 36 goals in 12 multiple scoring games. USC will playing away, be playing away at Berkeley this Saturday and have already secured the top seat spot in the MPSF tournament later this month. Remember the Alamo? Well, there's the possibility that the Trojans might after a bowl appearance at the Alamo Dome. The Trojans locked in bowl eligibility after the last weekend's win. Right now, according to experts, USC is projected to play at the Valero Alamo Bowl on New Year's Eve against Texas. 
most likely. There's also a slight chance that SC could head to the Pac-12 championship. <laughs> the Trojans are only one game down from Utah, giving USC wins out and Utah loses just one. Uh, but that's not very likely. The Trojans could head to the Pac-12 championship. And the North remembers that Oregon is still on top, but it is the other Oregon, Oregon State, that came out of nowhere and is now the second in the North. And I mean, you throw in the Pac-12's breast influence on some of these matchups and it's still anybody's game. Okay, so given that USC still has one road game and closes the season out against UCLA, what do you think uh, SC's post game is looking like, Lauren? I believe in USC and I want to believe in them, but as you said, Utah would have to lose and I just think at this point it's not very likely. Yeah, it's likely that SC wins, but not very likely that Utah will be seeing a loss in the rest of their season. But Oregon State, I'm sure, or I'm sure Caleb as an alum is happy about that. Back to you guys at the desk, Caleb Elizabeth. I'm really happy about that. <laughs> USC's Veg Fest is tonight. We'll have what it means for sustainability next.